All right. Welcome. Nice to see a full room at the end of the conference. I promise I'll make it worth your time to stick around until the end. We're going to talk about common API security pitfalls. APIs, well, you kind of know why you're here. Everybody today is building APIs. Everybody's building single page applications backed by an API, maybe a mobile application or a desktop application where it's going to be backed by an API. That's the way we do things. How you build that API, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about security. I'm going to talk about some of the things that might go wrong, some of the things I've seen go wrong in real APIs, whether I've seen it personally or somebody else has found it and published or talked about it online. That's what we're going to talk about right here. Why this talk? Because API security is getting more and more important. When they built the OWASP top 10, like the list of the top 10 most dangerous web security vulnerabilities, in 2017, they proposed to add an item of place number 10 under protected APIs because it was on the rise. In 2017, they noticed, like, you know what, there's a lot of APIs, and basically security is a very big problem in the API world. Turned out that the OWASP top 10 back then had like a big controversy. And they built a new version from scratch, which didn't include this item, but the seed was planted again back then. And then a bit later, actually um, last year, a group of people at OWASP published the API security top 10. So instead of having one item in the top 10 of web security vulnerabilities, it's, you know what, APIs are actually kind of different. We've seen a lot more data since then, and they built a full top 10 of security issues in APIs. You can find the project online, it's open, you can contribute if you want to, and you can definitely use that information in there. There's 10 items that occur a lot in APIs, how you can detect them, how you can fix them, and so on. That's what I'm going to talk about, more or less. There's going to be some issues that are in there, some issues that are not in there, but we're going to talk about API security. Just to make sure we're on the same page, let me show you what this actually means. We have a browser and we have a server somewhere, and we're loading an application. We're loading, basically, the application that we're going to run in our browser. An Angular application, React, Vue, whatever you're building, doesn't matter. That application runs as an independent client, and it needs something useful. It needs data, and it needs to perform operations, and that's where the API comes into play. You have a server somewhere, an API serving data, performing operations, and so on. You kind of know what we are talking about here, I hope. Otherwise, this talk is going to be a very big eye-opener, I might say, <laughs> to the use of APIs. And of course, we have a browser here, which can be a web browser on your desktop, laptop, mobile, iPad, whatever, but you also have native uh, mobile clients or web-based mobile clients. So a lot of web applications today are just repackaged, uh, a lot of mobile apps, sorry, are repackaged web applications. It doesn't just, doesn't, just doesn't look like a web app, but it definitely is one. All right, that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about the top part of this slide, the API part. And this slide is actually a very good illustration of some of the first problems you might encounter. That's people thinking that the client can handle certain security responsibilities. Yes, some things move to the client, but never any authorization-based security decisions. The client is, lives outside of your trust boundary. You have no control over the client. An attacker can open up the client and make it do whatever they want. You have to assume that the client is untrusted, always. A very good illustration is when you use Tinder. This is purely anecdotal. Uh, Otherwise, my wife would be very mad about uh, me talking about this. But if you use Tinder, you get these blurred pictures so you can see who else liked you. And of course, if you're on Tinder, you might want to know that. So of course, they sell you a subscription so you get unblurred pictures if you pay them. Of course, if people, if IT people, security people see this, they're going to be teased like, hmm, I actually want to know who likes me. So they start digging deeper. And they found that Tinder on mobile blurs the pictures on the client side. They fetch the picture from the API, and they blur it and then display it to you. So they dug a bit deeper, they opened up the web app, they figured out how the APIs work, and then they started sending requests with Postman, pretending to be a mobile application, and they got the pictures out just like that. That's one very good illustration of why you cannot trust a client. Here, it's kind of harmless. Maybe they even know, knew about it. Like, yeah, that's probably not the most secure thing. But you know what? That's good enough, because honestly, we don't care that much about it either. But you'll find this in other instances as well. You'll find applications that serve a lot of data to the client, and then the client cherry picks what they're going to display. Like, oh, we have a full JSON object, and we're only going to show these two fields, so it's good. But of course, somebody inspecting the data, somebody inspecting the API, will quickly figure out that the data is leaking anyway, and will extract that information one way or another. And the same thing goes with admin data, admin functionality, and so on, and so on. And that brings us to the very first pitfall. Never rely on the client for making authorization decisions. 
Don't overexpose data to the API because an, an attacker always has full access to all your API endpoints. You have to assume that. Authorization never lives on the client. That doesn't mean that you cannot do client-side authorization, but you cannot do it as an only defense. Every authorization decision on the client, which is good for usability and to detect uh, people tampering with the application and things like that, is useful. But always make the real authorization decisions on the backend in the API. Pitfall number one. We're going to cover quite a bunch. I honestly don't know how many. We'll see uh, where we end up in the end. I'm not going to keep count. Let, let's, tell, let's make it clear there. All right, authorization. Let's talk about authorization. We're going to talk about authorization a lot. So many issues are authorization issues. Let's talk about another case. I like these examples, not to make fun of these people messing up, but because they show real-world vulnerabilities in real-world systems built by people just like you. People that kind of know what they're doing, but make mistakes anyway. And I'm going to try to point these out and try to help you figure out if your application has these mistakes, yes or no. What happened here? T-Mobile, phone company, they allowed you to access your account. They're a phone company and they needed an ID to refer to your account. So if you're a phone company, you have phone numbers. Phone numbers are kind of unique, so that's a good identifier, you might guess. So let's just use phone numbers. So if I make a call to their API, it's going to say like uh, the account number with my phone number, and it's going to give me the account information for me. And if I do that with your phone number, I'm going to get your account information. And the same for you and the same for you. And of course, phone numbers, well, they're kind of innumerable, so you can easily grab uh, millions and millions of account information just from that API endpoint. It seems like a silly problem to have, like, come on. Who does that? Well, T-Mobile did that, but Telefonica in Spain had the same problem, and AT&T in the US had the same problem, and Verizon in the US had the same problem, and I'm pretty sure there's a few others that we don't know about that have the same problem. And this is actually really, really common. And it's known, it's, it has existed in web applications for a very long time. It's known as an insecure direct object reference. Because you have a direct object reference, the phone number, the ID, the whatever, and it's insecure because there's missing authorization checks. And phone numbers is one example. Documents, PDFs of insurance contracts is another example. This is Amer uh, First American, a, finan a financial insurance company in the US, and they had a very long document identifier, which was a number. You could go all the way back to, I think, number 79 and grab all of the documents like that from their server because there was no decent authorization in place. And these problems seem stupid. If I talk about this in my training courses, people are like, come on, nobody does that in practice. I mean, how hard is it to write proper code? Well, actually, it's not that hard to write it, but it's hard to think about it. Why? Because we build systems with tutorials. If you want to learn about REST APIs, you're going to find something, build Node.js, RESTful APIs in 10 minutes. I can tell you in 10 minutes, there's not going to be any security in there. That's OK. Because the goal is not to learn about security. The goal is to learn about REST and the HTTP verbs and how to do that. And you'll find things like, hey, let's build a to-do application, kind of the, the trivial example. Let's read tasks from there. And here you have a direct object reference. We're going to get the task ID right here out of the request, fetch the task, and return it. Deleting stuff, same story, delete the task. Well, you have a task ID that comes in from the request, and you can easily delete a task, and off you go. That's how we build REST APIs. And of course, if you build a system like that, your first REST API, you're going to do this, and you're not going to deploy that in practice. Of course not. You're going to learn about authentication afterwards. Like, oh, yeah, now we need users. So how do we authenticate the user? And you're going to read a few other tutorials and implement, hopefully, a good authentication system. Depends what you read. And essentially, you'll have some authentication in place. And then you need the mindset to think about, hey, authentication is one thing, but what about access control? And that's something that's often not covered. And if you forget about access control, you're the same as T-Mobile. Because they did check if you were authenticated, but they forgot to check object level access control. And that's how these, these problems come into existence. And these are hard to see in an application because it doesn't pop out. It's not like a wrong line of code. No, it's something missing. And unless you go in there looking for this particular problem, you're not going to find it. And there's a lot of applications that suffer from this. In an API world, we call that BOLA. Broken Object Level Access Control. It's a different name for IDOR, but it's the same vulnerability. Pitfall here, lack of proper authorization. There's a lot of applications. There have always been a lot of applications, and there are still a lot of applications built today that may check authentication, but not authorization. That's a very, very common problem. 
What can you do against that concretely? Well, take your application and audit your authorization policy. Look at it, like, hey, what do we check? Do we check these things everywhere? Every single endpoint, do we check that yes or no? Chances are there are a few where you don't check it. By the way, if you want to grab a copy of the slides, they're available on my website, so just go to my Twitter or my website and you'll find the link to the talk and a PDF of the slides with a lot more information than what I'm going to talk about here, in case you are interested in that. But authorization, auditing policies. I want you to go into your application and look at your policy. And you're going to find that it's not going to be that easy. Typically, what I see with a lot of customers is that authorization is there somewhat, but nobody really knows how or what. There's maybe one guy, if you're sitting together with four or five people around the table, there's maybe one person that's like, oh yeah, I, I know how authorization works. And everybody's looking at him or her, and it's like, yeah, we, we get something from here. So we get a request to our, our backend, and the request has like a, a token maybe, or a cookie doesn't matter much, and maybe a custom header for customers because we have different tenants. And based on that, we're going to make an authorization decision. But it doesn't end there. Because they have different services. Whether it's a microservice architecture or a monolith, you're going to have different components in your application responsible for different things. And each of these components is going to make authorization decisions. And that is your authorization policy. You may have an authentication check, like, is the user authenticated? Oh, no, he isn't. 401, done. Oh, the user is authenticated. Go, go ahead, go ahead. But let's perform some operations. And maybe there there's an object level check. Maybe there there's a customer specific functionality. So you have to differentiate between the tenants. So there's a customer check and a user check for accessing that particular piece of data and so on. And that is what authorization policies often look like. And auditing this is a freaking nightmare because nobody really knows what is checked where. You need to have a very strong and deep mental model of what the application does, where every bit of data comes from before we can decide whether this is a secure policy, yes or no. And honestly, I don't like that. Because that means if I come in to help them with security, it takes a lot of effort to understand what they're doing, to figure out if they have vulnerabilities, yes or no. And what would be better here is if you would have a centralized policy. I'm not saying to take away all of these checks and put them in one place. Keep the checks because they're good. It's good to have object level access control right here, but also have a central policy you can enforce where the requests enter your application. Because that central policy can be made independent of the application code. It's not going to be an annotation based thing you put in on methods and stuff like that. No, it's going to be either a centralized component or a policy language or whatever you're using, but it's something you can audit. It's something you can look at like what is allowed in my application. Like, oh yeah, that's a clear overview. We can look at that, we can test against that, we can write tests against our authorization policy only without looking at the code to make sure that what we think is expected behavior is actually enforced by our policy. That's a very, very important one that a lot of people just implicitly assume from the code like, oh yeah, that, that's probably our policy, but nobody really knows and that's a problem sometimes. All right. My apologies for the bright white light, by the way. <laughs> I'm not used to LED screens projecting that onto you. Uh, keeps you awake though, so that's good. All right. Making authorization decisions. What do we need to do that? We need to know who's making a call. We need some information, some kind of state, session state, authentication state. It doesn't matter what you want to call it. There's all kinds of definitions and none, none of them is really right for every scenario. So I don't, I don't care about names. I care about what it is. And if you take a step back 15 years, to the GSP age, the PHP age, ASP.NET, you had a server and you had a client, like a web app. One server, a couple of browsers, and that's about it. And then uh, things started growing, you had a, more, a few more clients and a few more servers in the back end. And we kind of knew how to handle that. Yes, load balancing is not really fun with server-side sessions, but it kind of works. Stateful sessions kind of work in that scenario. I'm not talking about stateful code. I'm not talking about code that behaves differently based on a property set somewhere in this in a weird object. No, I'm talking about keeping authorization state after the user is authenticated, keeping track of his authentication state or authorization state in a server-side session object. And whether you put that in memory or in a Redis cache, doesn't matter. It's a server-side stateful object. And if you build APIs, people are like, no, they must be stateless. Because REST says it must be stateless. And many customers, Go through the pain of making that stateless, learning about all of that, figuring out how to do that, often getting it wrong, 
to realize like, hey, why did we do that? Because we have one server running our API. It's like, that makes no sense. We only have 100 users. We don't have more users because we're a very specialized application. So what's the point of doing that? Yes, you can technically you cannot call it a REST API, but in practice, it still works. An API keeping track of state in a server-side session just works as well as another API. Of course, if you're building something like this, you might want to go for a stateless approach, because otherwise load balancing is going to be a pain in the ass to do that for a lot of servers, especially across different zones all over the world. That's not going to work very well. And their stateless approaches do work. But a stateless approach is vastly different from a stateful approach. So make sure you do it for the right reasons. You wouldn't be the first one that goes through the pain of moving towards a fully stateless API system only to realize that they didn't need that in the first place. If your people know how to deal with cookies and server-side session and session replication and session uh, sticky sessions, why not stick to that if that works for you? Again, there's nothing wrong with both approaches. Just make sure you switch for the right reasons. Make sure you switch for the reasons of scalability, not because some peop someone read somewhere that the REST API is always stateless, because honestly, on the web, it doesn't have to be. All right. Back to our image from here. This is server-side sessions. This is what a lot of people hate. Like, bleh, old school PHP sessions. Like, no, we don't want that. That's ugly. We don't want to keep that on our server. We want to move that to the client. Easy, right? On PowerPoint, it's just like you move a few circles down and you're done. In, in practice, it's going to be a lot more difficult. In practice, this is a kind of a secure environment. If you store something in memory on the server, guess what? Nobody can touch it. Well. If somebody can touch it, you have bigger problems than somebody changing an object on the server. But if it lives on a client, if you push it to a mobile app, to a web app, the attacker can be like, hmm, that's interesting, and they can change whatever they want. Meaning that you've just changed the security properties of that state, and that it's up to you to protect that state. So you're going to have to provide some protection. Integrity, ideally. No, integrity is going to be mandatory. Confidentiality, if you need it. Integrity will ensure that nobody can mess with it without you detecting those changes. Confidentiality, here, that data is confidential. If you put personal information, healthcare information in there, nobody's going to be able to extract that from memory from the server. And again, if they can, you have bigger problems. But here, if you put healthcare information here, it's going to live on clients, on browsers, and you need to protect that information. You need to ensure that it's protected against unauthorized access. How do we do that in practice? Of course, with a JSON web token. JSON web tokens have become the de facto standard. There's a few other mechanisms that might do something similar, but uh, today it's going to be a JSON web token, whether you like it or not. But everybody likes them because they're very cool and colorful, like uh, the red, purple, and blue part. Pretty awesome. You can put whatever crap you want in a jot, and it's just going to work. And they even have signatures. Well, if you do it correctly, but it's going to be hard to not have signatures in a jot. And the blue part here is a signature. And that signature offers you integrity protection. So how do you use that? Well, you can create a jot and sign it and push it off somewhere else, put the client, for example, and it comes back. And all of a sudden, you have a JSON web token, and you can verify that signature. And you get the claims, and you know that these have not been modified. That is integrity protection. Here's a code snippet of how to do that in Java. My apologies if you're not a Java person. I realize this is a, uh, probably a .NET conference, but uh, <laughs> bear with me. You can probably understand what's happening. So you have a jot here. The token coming in, it's, of course, not hard-coded. This is PowerPoint code, not production code. Uh, you get that from the request somewhere, and you decode that to get the claims out. And if you do it like this, you are absolutely screwed. But if I show this example in a training course, I did that in the workshop two days ago, and I asked, like, what's the problem here? And you have 20 people in the room looking at this example like, hmm, it takes them a minute or two for basically one meaningful line of code, like, yeah, what, what could the problem be? Then after like two minutes, there's one person like, yeah, I, I don't think you're verifying the signature. And it's like, yeah, you're correct. This is the way to do that. But this one gives you the data out of the JOT without compl complaining. It's like, oh, yeah, here's the JOT. I'm just going to throw away the header and the signature, take the data, and give you those claims in an object-oriented manner. Awesome. What you should do is verify the signature. This is decoding. It's basics for decoding. That's all it does. And the bottom example is actually verifying the signature. But unless you as a developer, first of all, read the documentation, which let's be honest, nobody ever does. So that's not going to happen. And unless you think about 
I don't do anything with a secret here, so that's probably not the right way. You might not notice that. I don't blame you for that. It means you need to know about these things. I kind of blame the developers of this library because they shouldn't have called it decode. It's built by a technical person that knew that decode is actually insecure, but they should have called it insecure decode or decode without verifying signature because that tells everyone exactly what it does, decode without verifying signature. And if you still write that without thinking about what it might mean, that's on you, not on the library. All right, pitfall here is mishandling client-side session data. Client-side session data seems like a, a simple thing, like just push it to the client, but in reality, it's not. In reality, this means you will have to do a lot of work to make this secure, and that is actually more tricky than you might think. I encounter a lot of problems with these things, and we're going to talk about shots for a while longer because there's a lot of crazy things going on. All right. Back to shots. The purple part is the interesting part. What do you put in there? Whatever you want. A jot is, the spec is nothing more than a way to represent claims securely. They call it claims. We might call it key value pairs, but this is a claim, key value. You can add arrays and objects and whatever you want. It's JSON, so whatever JSON allows, you can put into a jot. And it's to exchange them securely because it's signed and can be encrypted, and that's what the spec describes, how to make that work. What you put in there, that's up to you. You can build anything you want with a job. What you'll find in practice is a lot of people doing something like this. This is not a good way of doing things. This is what you'll find in a bunch of tutorials online to implement authentication in Angular. You have an API endpoint that accepts a username and a password, and when it's valid, it's going to generate a job, a token they call it, and they push it to the client, and that is going to be your state. This is basically replicating a PHP session or a JSP session or whatever in a job. And that's a very, very bad idea. This is often called token-based authentication, which makes even less sense because it's not about authentication, it's about uh, a propagating authentication state, but sure. Why is this a problem or why do people do this? Because people have some experience with traditional server-side sessions and they hate it with every fiber in their body, they're like, no, we don't want that. Because when you get a cookie, it's going to be a cookie with a PHP session ID or an ASP.NET. I don't know what the name for the cookie is, my apologies. But essentially, it's going to result in a lookup somewhere, in memory, in a database, in a Redis cache, in God knows where. You have to look it up and translate this into what does this mean? Who is this user? Like, oh, it's Philippe. Awesome. Yeah, he's allowed to make that, uh, that's, that call, so they can make an authorization decision here and give you the response. But with Angular, well, Angular doesn't really care about these things, but with an API, it should be stateless. So you have no state, so you don't have this step, so jots are really beautiful there, because now you can do this. You can send a jot to the API, the API can verify the signature, take the data out, like, yeah, it's Philippe, I knew that, bam, here's your response, awesome. And a lot of people implement something like this. And it's gonna work, until you run in a, into a scenario where you need to revoke a token. Because what's, what's the lifetime of this token going to be? Well, here it's eight hours, 12 hours, whatever your session lifetime is. Many people just replicate that for the job. Like, yeah, let's make it live for eight hours. Probably good there. Usually can get through the working day, and then uh, by the morning, they'll be logged out and have to log in again, but that's totally acceptable. And if you have to revoke one of these tokens, because if something goes wrong, this token remains valid for eight hours. If you get a token now, and your neighbor steals that, Two minutes later, he's going to have a token that's valid for seven hours and 58 minutes. That's a lot of crap he can post on Facebook in your name. So you might want to kill that token. Like, if you knew he has that, you can go say to Facebook, like, hey, please cancel this token. In this scenario, if somebody comes to you and says, like, I want to cancel my token, you'll be like, yeah, that's a good question. Revocation is virtually impossible here if you haven't planned for this up front because you have no control over that. Yeah, you can try to find workarounds, and a lot of people have found workarounds. And one of the workarounds is you can create a list of blocked tokens, revoked tokens, because every token can have a unique identifier, and you can put that unique identifier on a list. And then when a token comes in, you can check that list and see like, whoa, this token, no, he said that this token is not valid anymore, so I'm not gonna accept it. But if he comes to me and asks me to 
kill one of his tokens, I'm going to be like, oh yeah, what's the identifier of the token? He's going to be like, I don't know. I don't have it anymore. And somebody else has it, but I, I don't know what it is. So that's going to be a problem. So I need to keep a list of every token ever issued to every user and maybe every device so I can look up the identifier and put that identifier on a revocation list. And then I'm going to have to check every time a token comes in, I'm going to have to go to that list to check whether this identifier, the GTI claim, is on that list or not. And if it's on that list, I'm not going to accept that token. And I'm going to get something that looks a lot like this. Now we have a kind of a stateful list keeping track of a number of identifiers. And if you have 20,000 APIs, you're going to have to distribute that list to 20,000 APIs. Or you can build a single point that can verify that for you. So now you're building a single point of failure in your stateless, super scalable API system. And this doesn't really work. And there's a few alternative proposals as well. But in the end, it's going to come down to a massive problem with this setup. And the takeaway here is stop using JOTs for sessions, because a JOT is not a session object. Somebody else wrote a blog post about this all the way in 2015, I think, because that pattern was already happening back then. And when he wrote the blog post, it's a very sarcastic tone. It's absolutely amazing to read, so I highly recommend it. And a lot of people started giving him suggestions, like, yeah, but you can build revocation like this or like this. And he was like, leave me alone, people. So he wrote a follow-up blog post, basically to tell people, leave me alone. And that blog post has a very sarcastic flowchart of why this will never, ever work. Because every flow ends up in usability problems or security problems. Because this is not a session. And if you start building things like refresh tokens and so on, you're, seriously, don't do that. The reason this doesn't work is because you need a support system to make this work. OAuth, this actually comes from the OAuth world. Angle, a few people saw this in OAuth and were like, we're going to extract this little bit and forget about everything else. And that doesn't end well. Because in the OAuth world, you have a full supporting ecosystem to make these things work. You have refresh tokens and you have a central authority that will decide if it can issue new access tokens and so on. And the lifetimes there are short. 10 minutes would be ideal for a job. And if you lose it, that's only 10 minutes of crap on your Facebook wall instead of eight hours. And that makes it more manageable. You can even reduce a lifetime. But you need that supporting ecosystem if you want to make it work like that. And it's a very, very important takeaway here. Back to our chat. Jots. Well, there used to be a time when you could build an unsigned job today, and that's going to be very, very difficult. They're going to be signed. Traditionally, you'll find people explaining jots with the HMAC signature. That's the default mode you'll find online, explained everywhere. It's like an HMAC. And an HMAC is basically a keyed hash. It's a hash that takes data as input along with a secret. Your secret that you use there should not be super secret HMAC key. That's not a good secret. It also should not be in a PowerPoint slide shown to a few hundred people or God knows how many are going to watch the YouTube video. So be careful with that. How does an H mark work? Well, let me show you how it works. You have the data. In a JOT world, the data for an HMAC, HMACs do all kinds of other things or have all uh, kinds of other use cases, but in a JOT world, it's going to be the header and the payload. That's the input. I'm going to feed that into an HMAC algorithm. Well, a library, a JOT library is going to do that for you. But, and it's going to take the data as input along with your secret key, which is not super secret HMAC key. And out comes an HMAC, like a checksum, an integrity checksum of that data along with the key. And you're going to share that with the client, in this case, along with the data. JOT, that's the blue part being appended to the JOT, and it's going to be sent out to the other party. And whenever a JOT comes back in, you get the data and the signature, or the HMAC, and you're going to recalculate that HMAC with the secret key and the data, and if the result is the same as a signature attached to the JOT, then you know that the data was the same as well. If the result is different, then you know that something changed. You know that the data is not the same anymore. You don't know what changed, but we don't care. Kick it out. We don't want that token anymore. That's how HMAX works. Very easy, very straightforward, easy to implement because your key, your secret is like a string. You mash your keyboard a bit, keyboard a bit and that's going to be a random string. Don't, don't do it like that, but in reality, well, no, in reality, it's worse. Security people have looked at real systems, and they found that people use secrets here that they copy-pasted from blog posts. 
So if I write a blog post with super secret HMAC key, they found production systems using super secret HMAC key as the key for their job tokens. And that's a very big problem because attackers have lists of blog post keys that they try against job tokens. And the problem here is that you have a shared secret both for generating HMACs and verifying HMACs. And that means the moment somebody else has this secret, they can generate arbitrary JOTs which will be valid. And your application accepts that. This also means if your application wants to share a JOT with another application, they're going to be like, yeah, give me your secret so I can verify that this is valid. And you'll find people that are like, oh yeah, right, here you go. And now the other application has the ability to generate arbitrary JOTs. That's not how this is supposed to work, but many developers don't know that there's something else besides HMAX. There's a second signature algorithm that is much better. It's called asymmetric signatures, but you need to know about that. And then you need to go through the pain of implementing that, which is a lot less fun than HMAX, which is why most tutorials or people don't talk about that. Asymmetric signatures work like this. You have the data, you push it through a signature algorithm with a private key, and out comes a signature. And you share that, you append it to the JOT, and you send it out. And if you want to verify that signature, you're going to push it through a signature verification function. It's all in libraries because you don't have to worry about that. It depends on the algorithm being used. But essentially, it's going to spit out a true or false, or whatever your language does. And it takes as input the public key, and it's going to spit out true or false. And if it's true, you know that the message has not been changed. You know that the signature is valid, and the message is not changed compared to when it was created. Awesome. You even know that it was signed by the private key belonging to this public key. And if it doesn't match, either the key is wrong or the message has changed, but we don't care. In that case, we don't want it. And this is a much better mechanism, because this mechanism allows you to generate JOTs in one place with a private key that nobody else has. It's a private key. And the public key, everyone can know that. Everyone should know that. And with the public key, everyone that has that key can verify the integrity of a JOT. If you choose sign in with Google, for example, in the end, Google is going to give you, or it's going to give the application you're signing into a job with your identity information. It's going to say like, hey, this is Philip Derek, and this is his Google email address and his Google user ID. And Google is going to sign it with their private key, and everyone with Google's public key can verify that JSON web token. That's how this is supposed to work. And you need to use this mechanism in virtually every production use case. Even if you're building microservices, and you control all of them, you need to use this. Every service issuing JOTS needs to have its own private key because that is how you contain the risk. Because if one of them gets compromised, the other ones don't tumble over like dominoes. And that's very, very important. So HMAX can only be used in a single isolated application. One application issuing JOTS and consuming its own JOTS, yes, an HMAX is useful there. Every other use case, asymmetric signatures. No questions about it. Absolutely important. All right. If you're doing crypto, you're dealing with keys. And who, everyone who has, has ever done crypto knows that dealing with keys is actually the real problem. The crypto is, well, I wouldn't say easy, but fairly straightforward. In the JOT world, it's not different. But the spec has a lot of provisions, a lot of ways to handle keys. Again, something nobody ever talks about. Most people handling jobs is like, yeah, hard code the key, push it in our Git repo, and we're done. It's like, no, that's not the way of, of doing things. Keys need to be rotated. Keys need to be changed frequently. If you start using a key today, and you're still using the same key in 2025, you're going to be in a world of trouble because once enough data has passed or has been processed by a key, it becomes possible to analyze or derive information about it, and so on and so on. That's the dirty details of crypto. So what this means is you need to, an, a way to identify the key used to sign a job. Because today I might use key A, and in a week I might use key B. And the verifier needs to know what key did you use. And a simple mechanism to do that is a KID claim, the key identifier. The issuer of the job can include an identifier of the key that should be used to verify the signature. So if Google generates a job, they could include an identifier that says like, oh yeah, use Google's Monday key to verify this or something. It's a string. You can choose whatever you want for that string. That's an identifier. That's the simplest mechanism available, documented in the JSON web key specification. You have other mechanisms, more flexible mechanisms, because this implies that you know where to find that key. Another mechanism is a GKU claim. 
And the GKU claim contains a URL pointing to a JSON web key set, a JSON structure containing a set of public keys. And by including that, you can tell the receiver, like, hey, by the way, you should go here to fetch my key files, and then you should take the key with this very long random identifier and use that one to verify the signature. That's a more flexible mechanism, because if I'm issuing JOTs like this, and I want to rotate my keys, I can just create a new key pair, publish the public key on this location in that set, and send out the tokens. And everyone receiving them will know, like, oh, yeah, I have to go there, fetch the key, verify, oh, this is valid, awesome. Depends on what you're building with that, but that's how you exchange key material. Some people hate keys in JSON. I can't really blame them. It's absolutely ugly to put them there. And you might want to prefer certificate-based keys. Again, the spec has you covered. You have an X5U claim, which you can use to publish X509 certificates, TLS certificates, basically, which also contain a public key. So you can point to that certificate file, and the receiver can fetch that file and use the key to verify that signature. Awesome, right? This gives you the flexibility you need to manage keys. You can easily rotate keys, you can point to various particular keys, and you can make this work. And if you implement it like this, it's going to take some effort, and you're going to be happy once that's working. It's like, oh, awesome. Key management with JOTS. My boss is going to be very happy, because they totally understand how keys and JOTS work. It's like, no, I'm just kidding. However, your boss is not going to be happy when the attacker comes around, because your application is now kind of dangerous. As you told your application, if you find a GKU claim, just go there, fetch the keys, take this key with this key identifier, and verify the signature and accept the claims that are in there. So the attacker, if he figures that out, can now send you a token with a GKU claim pointing to evil.example.com, where you'll find the keys from the attacker. And then you find the key with this key identifier, which is going to be in there, and you verify the signature, which is going to verify, because the attacker has crafted that token with that private and signed it with this private key and published all that key material. And you'll find applications that don't verify or don't restrict the location of the GKU claim. They don't restrict where they fetch information from. And that creates a wide open hole. That means you went through a lot of effort to implement that, but have created a massive vulnerability, which is not a good thing. So this is really bad. You shouldn't do that. You can try to restrict hosts, like, oh, I only want to load it from here or from there. But it's going to be really difficult to lock this down. That's why. Real-world scenarios use different mechanisms. For example, OpenID has a discovery phase where you load basically a file from a well-specified fixed location from the identity provider. So if you log in with Google, you go to accounts.google.com slash dot well known slash OpenID configuration, and you're going to find a configuration file. And such a configuration file will contain a URI for the JSON WebKey set and will actually point you there. And this is a very fixed configuration mechanism that cannot be tampered with by an attacker creating arbitrary jots. And it's very, very important to be aware of these things and to prevent these vulnerabilities. You should prepare to handle key rotation. Don't use the same key over and over again. Rotate them frequently and make sure you have a mechanism to deal with those things in practice. All right. Let's keep you awake here. Bright light. <laughs> should add some stroboscope effect. No. <laughs> All right. Enough about shots. Let's talk about cookies. You can answer, that's totally fine. <laughs> Let's talk about cookies versus tokens. The old way of doing things. Cookie with an ID, that's the PHP way, the dirty way nobody likes. And the cool and uh, hip way is authorization headers with bearer tokens. That's what Angular applications typically do what versus what traditional applications typically do. Some people claim that this cannot work with an API, and they're absolutely wrong. There's no reason this does not work with an API. I can know because I run systems that actually do that. Of course, they both have pros and cons. But why stop there? Why not put a jot in a cookie, or a token in a cookie, and an ID in an authorization header? We can do that, right? Both headers contain a string. Nobody tells you what that string should be. Nobody tells you what that value should be. That is something you can decide in your applications. And this decision seems ridiculous. Like, why should I? Of course I'm going to use the authorization header. What are you talking about? But it actually matters a lot. By the way, 
An ID in an authorization header seems very strange, but if you use OAuth reference tokens, these are basically identifiers that translate into metadata on the server by the authorization server. So it's basically an identifier in an authorization header, frequently seen in those scenarios. But what I really want to talk about is that cookies are the only thing that work really well on the web. The, because the browser handles cookies automatically. The browser is very compatible with cookies. And many applications don't care about that. It's like, pfft, I'm, send, I'm, a, I'm an Angular app or a React app. I send XHR requests and I can add whatever headers I want. So I don't need cookies. And you might be right. Maybe. Maybe it works for you and for you, but maybe not for you. Because you're building an application that actually loads content from a server with HTML elements. Wouldn't be the first one to load images from a protected resource. Like, hey, these images are private to a user, and I need to make some authorization decisions when accessing that file. And guess what's not there when you make a request with an image tag? A custom authorization header. There's no way to add a custom authorization header to load an image or a video or an audio file with the HTML elements. Sure, if you start fetching the data separately and loading them in there, that might work. But with HTML elements, there's nothing there. But cookies are there. And I see this often in real-world applications where they need to rely on this behavior, on authorization on these calls, and they need cookies for that. And if you're fully invested in the authorization header, you're going to be like, oh, crap. We need cookies. So we're going to add a complementary mechanism next to this authorization header to also send a cookie. And it's going to be like, why? And many people regret their decision to go with the authorization header. So think about your use cases. If you need this, a cookie might be a better choice. You can still put an, an access token or a JOT or whatever in a cookie, sure. But it's the browser sending this on every request. That's the differentiator here. And there's a second place where this really happens a lot, and that's WebSocket connections. Because when you open a WebSocket, or server-sent events for that matter, you're going to type new WebSocket with a URL. And the browser is going to handle everything for you. The handshake and the upgrade or the, the protocol change and all of that is handled by the browser. And guess what the browser does not send? An authorization header with your custom bearer access token. And what the browser does send if, if they are available are cookies. So again, many people needing WebSocket connections, use the authorization header, and then have to start doing this ticket system. Like, I'm going to make an API call to get a one-time ticket, and that one-time ticket I can put in the URL of my WebSocket connection so I can authorize that call. I'm not joking. These things happen in practice. So again, that might be one of the reasons to consider the use of cookies. I'm not saying that cookies are perfect. They have their own set of problems. But they also have a very valid use case in web applications. Just to put this in, in, uh, next to each other, both headers, they're both basically headers, can contain anything you want. They're just strings. Cookies work really well within a single domain. If you're accessing 10 APIs on different domains, cookies are going to be your worst nightmare. Stay away from them, absolutely. An authorization header, you can send that anywhere you want. Cookies are handled automatically, which is a good thing. The authorization header, well, it's a good and a bad thing because it also leads to attacks. That's for the record. I need to be clear here. But the other one requires custom code to get information out of the responses, store it somewhere in the browser, and reattach it to outgoing requests. Code that you need to make decisions for and might contain vulnerabilities. And then finally, cookies are always present. And that's, I think, their main benefit in web applications. They're present on every request sent by the browser. While the authorization header is only present on requests you can control from within your JavaScript application. All right. So don't underestimate the impact of session transport. Really, really important. I call it session transport because we're transporting our authorization state or authentication state back to the backend one way or another. We need to do that whether you like it or not. All right. We're still good? I have a few more, not too many. One really big one and then a few small ones. Here's the big one. The big one is about cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is this really nasty attack in web applications. Everyone has it. It's like an opinion. Everyone has it. <laughs> a lot of people don't like it when they have it, for sure. Anyway, the problem here is that if you store your custom bearer token thingy in local storage, you'll find people arguing like, hold on, you're doing what now? Because if I have a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your application, I can break in 
and I can do local storage that gets all the keys and then get all the data out of local storage and ship it off somewhere else. And now I have your access token. That's a bad thing. So you'll find advice like this, like, you know what? Why not put that token in an HTTP-only cookie? Because then JavaScript cannot read it, and you're safe from cross-site scripting attacks. Awesome, right? HTTP-only cookies seem like a wonderful thing. But they're really, really, really not. They hide a symptom. They look secure from the outside, sure, until you push it and it's like, oh, apparently it doesn't work very well. Because an HTTP-only cookie allows you to hide a value from JavaScript, sure. Good. But the real problem is the cross-site scripting attack. The fact that the attacker can inject code and execute that code in your application. I like to compare that to a house. Let's say you have a nice house. You have some jewelry. Or your wife has some jewelry. Let's, I'll leave it in the middle. I'm not judging anyone here. And if you put it on the kitchen table, let's call that local storage, anyone that breaks in can easily snatch the jewelry and run away. So you might want to get a nice safe and put it in there and hide the safe so nobody can ever touch it. Awesome. But burglars can, can still get in. They can still break in. They can trash your house, deface all of the walls. They can hold parties. They can do whatever they want. And that's the real problem here. And taking away your jewelry doesn't fix the fact that you should probably get better locks or put bars in front of the window or whatever. And that's the same with cross-site scripting. Once the attacker is in, you lost. Once the attacker is executing code, they can do whatever they want. Using OAuth or a custom token service or whatever, they can just go there and get a new token and ship that off. They can show a login form to the user like, uh-oh, you're logged out. Enter your credentials again. And the user's like, okay, off they go. Password manager will even autocomplete it because it's in the same domain of your application and it looks legitimate. And that's a real problem. And I cannot stress this enough because this keeps coming up over and over again. Usually I don't point out these things by myself, but if people ask me, like, can you take a look at my blog post? I'm not going to say, like, yeah, everything is fine if they say things like this. These patterns are often, people often worry about that for nothing. If you're building something like this, my advice is put your crap in local storage. You know why? Because it's going to cost you two minutes to do that. Two minutes and you're done. And the time you save by having to re not having to research alternatives, let's say a day or two, because you're going to get distracted along the way, <laughs> I want you to spend those two days on learning how to prevent cross-site scripting in your application and auditing your code. Because that is much effort much better spent on those things than on trying to find a way to hide data in an HTTP-only cookie one way or another. It doesn't matter. Cross-site scripting means you lost. The attacker can do whatever they want. As far as you're concerned, the attacker is a legitimate application from that point on. So try to prevent cross-site scripting. Much more important. All right. What about this? Should your API accept data like that? What do you think? No, why not? It, sure. It looks like SQL injection. Well, in this case, I kind of agree because you probably expect a number, so it doesn't make sense to accept something like this. Brings us here. Something that a lot of people start with, I like to end with that. Lack of input validation. You need to have input validation. If you accept whatever crap somebody gives you, it's gonna, not going to end very well. Input validation should be as strict as possible without triggering false positives. Awesome. What about this Should your API except that piece of data? Yes? Why? But see, it's SQL injection. You change your mind quite quickly. It's like, no, no, SQL injection. And SQL, yeah, no, accept that one. That's good SQL injection. <laughs> that you, I'm messing with you. I'm, I'm totally messing with you. You're absolutely correct. This is a valid email address. This is a valid email address. If your API is implemented like, hey, let's validate this email address, it's going to be like, yeah, valid, bam, SQL injection. Well, if you have SQL injection because of this, you have another problem. I'm not going to talk about that here. But this is to show you that input validation will never save your butt. Input validation cannot prevent vulnerabilities. Input validation is a, is a necessary first line of defense, what I like to call to keep the crazy out. That's what it does. It rejects known bad data. But in the end, every vulnerability has 
better countermeasures and input validation. It's parameterization for SQL queries, and it's output encoding for cross-site scripting, and it's God know what, knows what for other vulnerabilities. But input validation alone will never be your primary defense, but you need to have it anyway, because you don't want five megabytes of password data to be acceptable data. You want to reject that and say, like, let's enforce a sensible length, like maybe 100 characters, but not God knows how many. And that is really, really important to take away. What happens when chocolate ice cream goes wrong? Well, even my kids know it's not ice cream. So, <laughs> Seriously, what happens when things go wrong? In a lot of cases, a seemingly silly vulnerability in an unimportant part of the application leads to a massive compromise. Like here, here's a search feature. Oh yeah, crap, that search feature had a cross-site scripting vulnerability and now our entire application is compromised. Oopsie. That's not a good thing. And that happens. And that brings me to the last bit for compartmentalization or a lack of compartmentalization. You need to compartmentalize your applications. We still think too much about full applications. Split it up in smaller parts. If you have different user levels, think about building different applications. If you have an admin part, usually admin parts are very separate. They don't overlap much with other functionality, so build a separate admin application and deploy that application on a different host. Users.restrograde.com, admin.restrograde.com. Why? Because the browser understands different hosts and domains and will isolate them from each other. And if something gets compromised in public.restrograde.com, it will not affect the other parts of the application. It will not trick an admin into logging in in the public part because they are used to logging into the admin part. And my password manager understands that as well and will not fill out my credentials in public only an admin. And that's really important. That's something that today almost nobody does. We still build large applications. Yes, it's a microservice, but everything runs under the same domain, and there's no isolation whatsoever. The browser doesn't understand pods. Browsers understand domains. Well, actually, scheme, host, and port, but the scheme is HTTPS, and the port is 443, so it's about domains today. So compartmentalize, split things up, and question everything. It's all about asking questions. And if you don't know the answer to the question, ask someone with more security knowledge. And if they don't know the answer in your company, tell them to go ask someone else. Because a lot of people are like, yeah, we, it's probably OK. We don't really know. It's going to be fine. And two years later, in the press release, it's like, yeah, apparently we had a problem. Yeah, you should have asked someone. I know we don't like to admit that we don't know things, but we really, that's the only way forward. Dare to ask questions, and if you don't know the answer, go find someone who has all the answers. And that's basically my takeaway message. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for staying.